So today's author, Neil King Jr., grew up in Colorado in a house where his backyard was the incredible Rocky Mountains. He studied philosophy at Columbia University, and for 20 years he was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, where he traveled to more than 500 countries. He also served as the chief diplomatic reporter in Washington, D.C. American Ramble is his first book. Joining him is an avid reader, a fly fisherman, a Tai Chi Sifu on Saturday mornings at Sunnylands, and also my husband, Doug Miller. Welcome them, please. I'm not kissing you. <laughs> I know I'm supposed to put this away, but first I have to take a photo. If that's okay. Oh, lights. Oh, well, I'm not going to make you jump up. <laughs> so welcome to the desert. I, I know that you went to Joshua Tree. You did the Indian Canyons. We may have some time to talk about it. You're thinking about another book. You interviewed a couple of local people here in the desert, but welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. It's beyond a pleasure to be here. It's fantastic. So at lunch today with Jamie, I, I he asked me you know, what I thought of the book, and I told him, well, I think I've done probably 20 or 30 interviews. Most of you have been here for those. And I told him that you're in for a treat because this is the best book that I have read. It is wonderful. It's about a journey, both physical. It's a history book in some sense, but it's not really a history book. It's serious. It's funny. It's emotional. There are some places in here where I laughed out loud and others where I cried. So you are really in for a treat. This is a wonderful, wow. wonderful book. Wow. So, <laughs> so I think I have to start with why. Why do a walk from Washington, D.C. to Manhattan in New York? So I live, I have a house, um, an old house that's nine blocks east of the U.S. Capitol. Um, we moved there um, 25 years ago, shockingly. And one morning, it was probably 10 years ago or something like that, I just had this idea while walking to the Metro, well, what if I were just to walk to New York at one point? Um, kind of like, what would it be like to compete with the cars or the train or the airplane and just find your own way? Um, and it was a ridiculous idea. Um, and it just sort of festered in my mind for a long time until I started to really think about how did the old timers do it? How did George Washington do it to go to his inauguration? How did um, Ben Franklin, how did anybody at that time move around? And the more I looked at the routes, the stories, the richness of everything in between, the more I realized, okay, I've got to do this. I've got to find the time to do it. And I've got to go out and give it its due, you know, because there was so much in between. It was never a physical feat, like, oh, aren't you going to be impressed? Um, it was all about um, giving, kind of paying homage to the land in a lot of ways. And you, and you literally just took a backpack, right? Very small backpack, yeah, yeah. So, again, he had me from the first paragraph, <laughs> but on page eight, he talked about that as part of what he took was a collapsible fly rod. That was it for me. <laughs> I knew I was gonna I love know. I was gonna love the book and, and love you. So we're gonna do something different. We're gonna do pictures because I think the pictures add to what he describes. And I'm also gonna have him read some of the passages because they are poetic and they are wonderful and inspirational. So tell us about the route that you took. So how did I you develop that and, and what was the route? Well, you know, I had thought about, I don't know, I'm sure a lot of people in the room know this corridor, know the East Coast quite well. I had thought about all kinds of different routes, including one that would have taken me up the Jersey Shore until I realized it would be Atlantic on my right and, you know, Jersey Shore on my left, and that would be kind of limiting after a while. Um, I kind of realized as I started to, to mull it that I had to go through a section of the Mason-Dixon line between Pennsylvania and Maryland that would be important and kind of rich in the history of what that line means. And the more I then looked at it, I knew I had to go to Lancaster County because, you know, this is a county 
that's famous for what I kind of like to call the longest social experiment in, in American society outside of the Indian Pueblos in Arizona or in New Mexico, you know. Um, and the Anabaptists, the, Mal the Mennonites and the Amish have been doing this thing they do there for, you know, 300 years almost. And um, so there were all, and I was kind of drawn by the stories that I knew I could find there. So when I decided I've got to go to Valley Forge, I've, I kind of finally said I can't skip Philadelphia. It was the stories kind of determined the route, basically. So I just want to read a quick passage. I could tell within blocks that my walk would bend time, that for the body in motion, time moves more slowly. The walk would make the present more expansive, but also open layers of the past to my inspection. What did you mean, bend time? You know, it's a, a lot of the book is actually about time and how we spend time and also how malleable time is. And in this case, with a great degree of attentiveness and with great intention, I walked out my door, 26 days I took this walk. Those 26 days on the last day of my life will still probably stand out with a higher degree of vividness than the vast, vast majority of my time because there are you know, the Greeks knew and they talked about how there were two forms of time. There's kind of the, you know, basic chronological clock time that is where, it go, where time goes where we've, when we've wasted it or we don't know where it's gone. And then there's the, the kind of illuminated golden sections of our lives where things just stand out. And I think it's fair to say because of the kind of frame of mind I'd gotten myself into in walking out my door, that the whole of that span was in that kind of bent time, kind of elongated time. So you went first <laughs> to the Lincoln Memorial. Why? You know, I, I, I made the argument, and we could, I could corroborate it right here by embarrassing someone to say, if there's anyone in this room who hasn't been up the steps of the Washington Memorial, sorry, the, the Lincoln Memorial, please stand up. <laughs> um, maybe there is somebody who's shy, but... Um, you know, I, I make the argument, not so much, I guess maybe I do in the book, that that's the place that we all as Americans have most in common, that basically all of us have been there. Maybe we've all been to, you know, Times Square or other places you could list, but, you know, and that is a sanctuary to not just the person, but to his words. And he was, by a long stretch, the greatest writer president um, we'll ever have, I, I think it's fair to say. And the fact that some of the most extraordinary of his words are engraved on the wall, I had to sort of start there. So you're about a half a day into your walk, and you're This on... was the next day, actually. Th this is the, the second day? Oh. Well, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were going on to the next slide. I'm I, sorry about that. I, sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought I did. Let's yeah. see. There we go. Yeah. There we go. So you're about a half, this is, I think, in the first day or the second day? It was the second, second day. day. Second, second day. day. Oh. You're on what you called the road to Woodstock. and <laughs> <laughs> Not that Woodstock. <laughs> <laughs> and you say this, coming back up to the road, I saw an older couple approaching, just out for a morning stroll, as jolly and unexpected as could be. It was like walking, it was like the past was walking towards me. So I just stood and waited for it to arrive. Tell us about these two people. You know, I call this chapter the parables because there were several things that happened on that just being the second day out that had the quality of a New Testament parable. That, And I realized that the whole walk was going to be um, parable-like and that, you know, we have these parables because... You know, Jesus or whomever is walking down the road and has a one-off experience with one person that resonates for others. And in this case, I had come to this bridge that was too narrow for a pedestrian to cross and too congested with cars. So I had to find another way to get around this bend. And there was a very old extension of the road, oddly enough, that was right there to the left. I meet this couple. We start to talk. Their names was the Herders. And I told, they said, where are you going? And I said, I'm on my way to New York City. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm on the, while uh, on the walk, I'm going to go to Lancaster. I'm going to go to Ephrata, which was a place outside of uh, Lancaster. And they said, Ephrata, 
you're going to Ephrata. We used to live in Ephrata at the end of Crooked Lane. And um, we lived with this family called the Hoovers, and we haven't heard from them for years, and we don't know if they're well. Uh, and I said, well, I'll find out. I'll go <laughs> to, to meet the Hoovers at, 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 on Crooked Lane. And they were, they were like, you will? And I said, yeah, of course I will. And so, as I said in the book, I left them as I had been a pilgrim already. I was on a pilgrimage. Now I was a messenger. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, it just sort of changed the whole complexion of the walk. So I, I wondered if you could, if you would read starting there. and that. Um, one bridge I couldn't cross led me to a bridge no car could cross. I found that fact and the whole of the past 10 minutes so marvelous that I laughed out loud. When I crossed that little bridge over Cattail Creek, I was amazed that by avoiding one bridge and taking another, I became a messenger of good tidings between plain folk who hadn't been in touch for years. If before I had been a pilgrim, now I was a courier, a deliverer of good news, I returned to the main highway, a different person in the same shoes. So you, you talked about uh, this one chapter called Parables, and uh, you talk about your water bottle's empty, hmm. you meet someone and ask if they would allow you to fill your water bottle, you're abruptly told no, and then sternly told to leave, and then you meet Ted. Tell us about Ted. Yeah, so the, the, that was one of the other parables, was the parable of the empty water bottle, a guy outside of his mansion, essentially. And I said to him, do you have any idea where I could fill my water bottle? Which was sort of a loaded question. Um, and he <laughs> said, well, yeah, and he gave me elaborate directions for a convenience store that was like two miles behind where I had just come. And I said, oh, no thanks. And uh, he never quite got the idea that his house was brimming with water. He could have filled my water bottle. So when I came upon Ted, he was out, as you can see, getting his trash can. And he wondered what I was doing walking through his neighborhood. And I told him, and he looked at me. I told him a little bit about um, where I'd come from. And he launched into this sermon. Um, yeah, this, by the way, in this case, I said, um, I'm going to turn on my phone to record what you're saying. And so this is him verbatim. Here's what you're doing. Here's how I see it, Ted said, looking at me as though he had a bead on my deepest intentions. You've been close to all that in Washington, the chaos at the Capitol, COVID, the whole police, Black Lives Matter thing. You've seen the shootings and beatings, the killing of George Floyd, the protests and violence that came after, all of that. We're all screaming. We're all reaching out. And your walk is to calm the storm to center yourself to where you can be anchored in a frequency that will bring everybody into one harmonious vibration. And so he goes on to say, um, this is a holy walk, a walk of healing. And I said, uh, wait, Ted, do I understand you're saying that if I heal myself and get myself in tune, I'm going to get the whole country in tune? <laughs> and he is like, yeah, that's what you're going to do. And I was like, that's some serious stuff, you know. <laughs> People have said, um, if there was one person you could take the whole walk with, who would it be? And I think it might be Ted, because he was such a character, and he had been through a lot of stuff. You know, mind you, I spent maybe 10 minutes talking to him, and that was the whole of it. Um, so what do I know about Ted? Only the fragment of a time that I had spent with him along outside of his house. But he did fill up your water bottle. He did. By the way, just as an aside, I just have to note, I was walking on a long trail at Joshua Tree two days ago, and my water bottle, I was, it, it, the top came off. I have holding the top. The water bottle falls. It basically empties into the desert. I pull it up. There's like an inch of water left. And I was like, damn. And this woman who was way down the trail, she said, are you okay? What happened? I said, I lost all my water. And she said, my friend has water she can give you. And I was like, you're going to give me water in the desert? You know, like I was like, this is the most generous offering. And then I told her the story about the other guy, and she's like, whoa. So anyway. 
<laughs> so the next chapter that I want to talk is called Walking the Line. And I want to describe what you say at the beginning of that chapter. On a brisk morning that chilled the fingers. And before I read it, what I've read and what you've heard him read is why this book is so fascinating. It's just poetic. It gives an insight into, to, I think, Neil, but also into us. It creates these emotions. That, that's why I said this is the, the best book Jamie's had me read, and he's had some good ones. So I, I'll start again. On a brisk morning that chilled the fingers, I set off to walk to a line, a line drawn by a man named Mason and a man named Dixon. So tell us about this. You know, this is one of these amazing moments where I had spent a lot of time reading about Mason and Dixon and these two curious people and why they had been a team in the first place and why they went there to draw this line. And I, that's a long story that I won't tell. But so I was really fascinated by what I could find on this line when I got there. Of course, there being no real line. Um, but so I got um, to this road that was the line, the Mason-Dixon line, was the border between Maryland and Pennsylvania, was the divide between the allegedly free and the enslaved part of the country. And I then looked down this, this um, gravel dirt road and I saw this farmhouse. And I was like, wow, that's so amazing. So I sort of snuck around the back way and I came up to it. And this is a uh, probably built in the 1820s German um, farmhouse built primarily with field stones as opposed to quarried stones with such care. Nobody was living there. So I had this time to go into the barns and examine the hinges and really look at it up close. And what was so fascinating to me is that that balcony, which was built with such elaborate engineering to have no support underneath it, etc., was right over the line itself. So part of where the tree is was the enslaved part of America, where the house is was the free part, so to speak. Um, and I was just fascinated by the idea of the man and his wife sitting out on their porch and looking into the enslaved part of America and sitting in the other part. And I don't know, it was just the whole thing was felt like such a discovery. So there were a lot of those along the way. So not about the picture right now, but you're on this long walk. Did you ever get lost? Yeah, a couple of times, quite fortuitously, there was a great moment, actually it was just hours after that, where my phone, which are useful devices, right, um, had gone, run out of batteries. I actually got caught in a brief snowstorm, which was glorious. And I was having these kind of moments of rapture and like pure crazy joy, um, which I describe in the book. And one of them was when the snow first came in. But because I needed to find my way, I met this really wild kind of John Brown style auctioneer who was inside this barn with all these tractors that he was going to auction off that weekend. And he was very sort of fundamentalist sort of person. And I started talking to him and he said, God had taken his love away from America and all this kind of stuff. And it turned out to be a fantastic encounter with that guy, which as I told him at the end, I said, you know why we met is because I was lost. My battery had worn out. I needed to find somebody to give me directions. You were the person to give me directions. His politics were profoundly different than mine. And yet my being in that barn with him, talking about tractors and all the rest of it, there was a lot that I really liked about him. And it became a kind of example of if you share a common ground with someone, even if you might not share the same beliefs, there's um, a link that defies the things that might otherwise divide you. Um, kind of an obvious thought, but an important one. So... You have a, I think, a fascination with water. Yes, and I do. and with rivers. Um, this is another book that's full of historical facts, full of geography facts. Um, but I was intrigued because you love the Susquehanna River, um, and I learned so much about it. Four hundred and forty miles long, twenty-seven thousand square miles of tiny streams and creeks that drain from it. Um, and the fifth oldest 
over 300 in the world million yeah. years it was actually a river that once flowed kind of down the middle of pangea when there was once this big kind of mono continent before it all broke apart and the appalachian range was part of that uh, much higher at that time so so you didn't walk the entire way right so t tell us about i think this is uh paul nevin yeah. paul nevin yeah so uh, just just to pause very briefly on the Susquehanna, you know, one of the things I did when I walked out my door was I basically said to myself, I hereby grant myself the right to be astonished and amazed by things that are otherwise ordinary, which I think is an important thing for all of us to do all the time. And yes, the Susquehanna River, if you drive I-95, if you take the train, you go over it a million times. And you're like, oh, it's the Susquehanna. And yet, this is an extraordinary body of water with that kind of history that is worthy of stopping and paying homage to, which is sort of what I did. So this guy, Paul Nevin, I'd, I'd heard about through some people. That rock behind him is called Big Indian Rock. You could even go to the other one if you want. And he, now, any of you who live out here, there's a lot of um, indigenous art or remnants left behind from the you know people that were in that place prior to us all arriving. And in this case, quite remarkably, the petroglyphs on these rocks were, um, are one of the only versions of indigenous art you can find within hundreds and hundreds of miles around. Um, and I know, for instance, the Joshua Tree, there's a place there with some petroglyphs that have some similarity, though they're, some of them are actually painted. So in this case, he's using a wet sponge, and he's sort of wetting the area so that it gives the highlight. Thunderbirds, bears, all kinds of things. And this was just, a, this was actually, yeah, Easter's coming up. It was Easter afternoon, and Paul took me out there. And this was a hugely important part of his life and was such an extraordinary afternoon for me. And when I went on, I would talk to people. Oh, I went out to see these petroglyphs, and they would say, what petroglyphs? You know, and I'd be the ones that are 20 miles away over there, you know, they might have heard about them, but they had never taken the time to go see them. Um, and they're really worth it. So can I get you to read? Oh, um, okay. We stood and listened to the water gurgle as it rushed around the rock, heading to the bay into the ocean. Our shadows splashed long across the stone, just as there are hidden passaway, passageways in native mythology that give entry to the underworld, I had slipped through some magical door, the latched gate in front of my house, and found myself here at this sacred place, toes gripping the warm rock as many other toes had for thousands of years. I shut my eyes to feel the sun and give thanks for the whole of it. So... In one of the videos I saw of you talking about the book, you said Lancaster County is one of the places if you were to go back to, you would go back there. So yeah, absolutely. The book now kind of moves into Lancaster County, and we'll go to some pictures there. So why would that be so special? To you know, what's really there are these demarcation places in the American continent that are huge um, and gaping, kind of, you leap from one place to another. And the, when you go across the Susquehanna River from York County into Lancaster County, it's just a whole totally different way that the Mennonites and the Amish organized their land, built their farms. And it has a beauty about it that's just striking. And this bridge, which I, which I just suddenly saw off the side when I was crossing, I'm standing at Mike's on a bridge myself, and I was like, wow, this looks like something that was in Italy, you know, built in the, during the Renaissance or something. And with that grass going over it, and the bridge didn't actually take that little lane anywhere. So I, it, was, it had multiple mysteries about it, but this was the very beginning of what became a magical day. Oh, this is a, um, a video. Well, no, we're just going to do the Okay, good. Here. Okay, good. So in that case, I went through a covered bridge, which is actually right near that bridge I just saw. And that was kind of the through the looking glass or sort of the, the back of the wardrobe entry into a truly magical territory that that day represented. So the next chapter is called Renewing the Mind. It may not have been the actual next chapter, but it was. you kind of describe this as the heartbeat of the book. And... I appreciate that because for me, it was probably the most emotional aspect. 
So, Stephen, if you could go to the next picture. Oh. And and no no back no up. no back yeah, up. There we go. go. Whoa. Another one. One more. Go one more picture oh. back. There. There we go. So what I what I want you to do okay. is read this passage and then talk about this picture. This is the start of this chapter. She was standing with her knees slightly bent in a patch of grass and sunlight behind a brick schoolhouse. She was focused on something in the distance and wore a long floral dress that extended to her ankles. She was in her early teens and had a white head covering over a bun of her hair curled neatly in back. I was walking up the road when I saw her and then caught sight of a leather mitt on her left hand and then heard the solid whack of a baseball bat. The way she drifted back and so effortlessly fielded a hard-hit fly ball and hurled it back the other way, that and all the rest of it, everything made me stop in amazement. I knew then that I had stepped through the wardrobe into a magical land. So tell us where you are. So this was such, you know, I'm walking up this road and I turn to my right and I see what I just described there. And then I walk back behind the schoolhouse and these kids are playing uh, this very aggressive game of softball. And at the end of their lunch, they all come across the field towards me. Neil Weaver is off to the left there, um, over here, off to the right, I guess. Um, the teacher, he says, what are you doing? What brought you here? And, and you know, so much of the walk was about belonging and the kind of the idea of, do you just arrive in a place and do people act as if you belong there? Do they welcome you there? And Neil said, um, when I told him, he said, kids, gather around. Let's hear what Mr. King has to say, which I thought was such an extraordinary thing. And so I started joking with them. And one of the young women who's pictured there Laura Hoover, I will remember, she stepped forward and she said, Mr. Weaver, could we sing for Mr. King? And they invited me into their schoolhouse, into the basement, and they sang these two hymns that actually had been written by Neil's aunt, if I remember it right, that really, truly blew me away. And we have one clip of one of them. So what was so uh, well, keep going was so amazing. So these are eighth and ninth graders. It's opening day, which today is of baseball of the baseball season. Beautiful day in spring. They had just been out playing softball. They're on the cusp of early adulthood, and I don't know if you heard the, what they were saying. It was beyond. It basically, this is not a direct quote, but beyond this troubled veil we're in now, there is this other place that I long to be, essentially. And this this song and the other song they sang were both about the afterlife. And I was so sort of astonished by that fact. Um, but I was more than anything just completely blown away that they uh, th they immediately recognized that I was sort of there to give thanks to the people that I met along the way. And this was their way of returning that sentiment. And it was so sincere and so natural that um, I, I, anyway, it was, it was quite an emotional moment. One of the things I'll just mention briefly, when I was leaving the school, I went down the hall to fill my water bottle, which was always an issue. And, um, <laughs> and I was very attuned to what Neil was going to say when he went back into his classroom. So he walks into his classroom and he says, now, as you'll all remember, we were studying our grammar so if you'd please turn to page 18, let's get started. And I was like, wow, there was none of, well, that was interesting, wasn't it? And I was told later, Neil told me they devoted an entire page to their year, in their yearbook to, about me showing up at their school. Um, but they were so focused and so disciplined in the way they go about what they do that is like, let's just get back to doing what we were doing, okay? It was uh, really amazing. What, and tell us a little bit about what Neil told you about conformity yeah. and nonconformity and then a quote that he gave. So I, I asked Neil when the kids went up to the school, I said, tell me a little bit about the Mennonite faith. What, what is it about? And he said, well, it's mainly about two things, non-resistance, 
We don't fight in wars. We don't have contested legal battles. We don't sue people. Um, and nonconformity. And I was like, tell me about the nonconformity. It's a little hard to understand because obviously you almost have a dress code, right? And, and, and within their own culture, there's a lot of demand to conform. But what was fascinating to me is that they decide, which most of us in this room don't do, what they're going to take and not take that comes to them from the outside world. So none of us in this room probably ever said, you know what, I don't think I want Netflix to be a part of my life or whatever. They, we just sort of, it comes, we take it. And they don't do that. So, but when he was talking about um, the nonconformity thing, he quoted just off the top of his head um, a passage from St. Paul to the Romans be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And when he said that, and he kept talking, I was like, wait, 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 Neil, what was that thing you just said a couple of minutes ago? And he said it again, and I was like, wow, that's kind of like, a, uh, it, it sort of crystallized the whole of the walk. The idea that you don't need to have the world tell you how to live or how to see it but you can renew yourself and replenish your own mind if you go about it the right way, basically. And I, it was just another, there were so many moments throughout the whole thing that was just kind of like, wow, thank you for having given me that clarity. You know? So when you left on your walk or in your pre-planning, was your intent to write a book? You know, the idea at the outset was not a book at all. It was about the kind of craziness of doing it. But the more I immerse myself in it, the more it became, it had to be a book. So by the time I walked out my door, I knew I was writing a book. Absolutely. And, and did you write the book along the way or keep a journal? How, how did you record? You know, experience? quite amazingly, um, though I never listened to a podcast, I never listened to one moment of music. I never had one extraneous thing going in my ear off my phone. Um, the device itself, of course, is a miraculous thing. And I use the notes function on my iPhone to dictate my description of any of these encounters. So when I would walk along after that, instead of stopping to write it, I would write it verbally. And each of those, at the end of the day, I would then turn into a dispatch that I sent out to several hundred people that were friends and friends of friends. Every morning I did that. So it was like a kind of a log of the, of the walk. And that became really the first draft of the book. And there's actually quite a few sentences or portions of the book that were written while walking, essentially, which I think is a little bit of the cadence of the thinking and the walking. And so it, I wanted it to have that feel. And, and you talk about in the book that during that journey, people started to recognize you. So <laughs> h how did they learn you were on this walk? You know, I, I was with well, somebody a couple of days before I left said, you know, you should do a tweet thread. And I, I'd never really done a tweet thread. So I, I think, oddly enough, by the time I got to New York, there were 76 posters, I mean, of 76 postings I'd done, which, you know, 1776, Sarah, I was like, that's strange, it was 76. Um, but that got a lot of attention, so you know, see, um, morning edition did a thing, and there were there was a lot of, it gathered attention. So I had a number of people along the way who stopped and said, wait, are you that guy who's walking to New York? And I was like, <laughs> um, so tell us about these next two. Oh, this, this is a quick, uh, when it gets there, a funny. So going back to Crooked Lane, I met, I went, I found Crooked Lane. That, that was such a fantastic part. And so these are the Hoovers. Daryl and his dad, I forgot his dad's name right now. So what's so funny about this photo is I said, um, do you guys mind if I take a picture? And they said, oh, no, 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 we don't do that. Um, you can take a picture as long as you do it on the sneak, was how they set up. And so doing it on the sneak is they'll just stand there looking this way, and then you take a picture of me, but I'm not looking at you. But Daryl is like kind of looking at me and saying, this is kind of funny. But they're not selfie people. They don't, they're not into that kind of stuff at all. Um, so you, you did get to go back, the herders who you talked in the very beginning, these were their friends, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did end up going back to the herders and telling them that they were fine. And I went back again and gave them the book and so on. So this was... So, so I, let me yeah. set this up. So yeah. in your preparation, you went to the Library of Congress and, and you looked at maps because they have a significant number of maps. You also came across some photographs. 
And one of those photographs was this house, the Fry house. Tell right. us about it. So this was fascinating because there was a photographer with the Farm Security Administration in the 40s under Roosevelt when they did a lot of these kind of WPA things who was sent around Lancaster County to take photos of life there, rural life. So I came across these series of photos of this house. This is not one of his photos. That's my photo. Um, where he said at the time, seven generations of the Fry family had lived. And um, I was like, wow, I got to go figure out if the Fry family's still there and, and talk to them about they're probably now in like the 10th generation. So I did. I tracked down the house and I went to the grist mill right next door. I knocked on the door there and S Simon Fry, who is now representative of the ninth generation, if it goes over to him, um, was there, and it was such a, in that chapter I talk about somewhere people and anywhere people, and it's probably fair to say that everyone in this room probably is an anywhere person. You weren't born in Rancho Mirage, probably you moved here from somewhere else. You've lived all over the world or all over the country, most of you. And Simon has lived in that same place his whole life, and so did his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, great-grandfather, going all the way back to something like 1749 when the first Fry bought that place. And I loved it because it was at the corner of Fry Road and Friesville Road. You know? yeah. And the only Fries were those Fries. There were no other Fries. There, were no, there was nobody else but Fries in the whole town. So, so if I could get you to read that. Oh. Um, Simon's forebear, Hans Martin Fry, came across with his mother and siblings aboard the Two Sisters, which sailed up the Delaware and deposited them in Philadelphia. It was the third ship to arrive among a fleet of 23 that brought so many Germans across the Atlantic that year. I asked what month that might have been, and Simon pulled out the bottom drawer of a desk and extracted a document, glanced at it, and said, They arrived on September 9th, 1738. He had in his hand a copy of the ship's manifest. <laughs> yeah. So, so all these interesting people you met and, and all the trails you went through, did, did you feel like you belonged? Yeah, you know, there was a great moment. I was late by about an hour getting to Simon's house. Um, that morning I was walking down the road and um, there was a sign that said, horseshoeing. And there was like a, you know, this sort of illustrated thing of a, in a car thing of a horse kind of cruise along. And then I heard ding, ding, ding up the drive and there was a barn there. And I was like, wow, I got to go see what that's about. So I walked up the drive, walk into this barn and this guy has a horse hoof in his lap and he's hammering and he looks over his shoulder and he's, his first words are, well, what do we have here? <laughs> um, which, which I thought was so funny. I'm like, ah, uh, well, I'm just this guy who's walking on to New York, seeing how things are going out here, and 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 we just started talking. And um, he told me all about shoe shoeing the horse, and the horse's owner with his buggy was sitting right there with his kid. And you know, that's why I actually talk a little bit in that portion about the whole concept of belonging, and you know. And I am not fully acknowledging that not everybody walking in that barn is going to be received with a, well, what do we have here? I happen to come off the way I do and be kind of good at mixing it up with people of different types. So, But in that moment and many, many other moments, I was given the feel, the sense of belonging there, even though I'm not a Mennonite. And, um, and I think it was sort of a mutual thing that we sort of, you can find, you can form these bonds as long as you have sort of the right approach, the right um, attitude about it. And was there a common question? You, you talked about Not one really. video, I, a common question they asked you about kind of where are you going, where are you off to? Uh, they, they would do, yeah, they would definitely, well, what's the purpose of it? I was basically like, I'm out to get a feel for what's going on in the country and the thinking of people I meet. And a lot of people I would say, not facetiously at all, but, you know, even if this whole walk had been just to meet you, I would have taken it. Because like Ted, um, I met so many people along the way that was like this, you were my destination, you know? Yeah. 
So you have a chapter entitled One Winter Long Ago, which is kind of burned into our American history, something that we're all taught about uh, Valley Forge and the difficult winter. And here you are now in the Delaware Canal. Tell us about that. Actually, yeah, so we're this tight mixing up. So in this case, I'm walking to Washington's Crossing, Crossing. which actually occurred the winter before the Valley Forge winter. The Valley Forge, which is before Philadelphia, I'll just mention briefly, I went to Valley Forge um, and I met this really great woman who had written a whole history book on the remembering of Valley Forge. And what I was there to write about wasn't really particularly that winter um, when, you know, they didn't know anything about anything and the, the cause was in bad shape. Um, they didn't even know that you shouldn't let your latrine, like, run into your water source. Um, but, um, and, you know, um, von Steuben, the famous uh, German general who showed up to basically teach America how to do things like that. Um, but, you know, it would, took us almost 100 years to care about Valley Forge. It's really fascinating. Like, um, it, Custer got a memorial at the last stand site before anybody was memorializing Valley Forge. Um, of course, Gettysburg had already had the Gettysburg Address, et cetera, well before the Civil War even ended. So we were into memorializing things already, but we weren't really into memorializing the the Revolutionary War, which, well, I know you were talking about, Jamie, about devoting one of the writer series to, or maybe more to the sesquicentennial, whatever is coming up. That issue about when we decided to care about the founding years is really an interesting one, and a lot of people are looking into that now, the kind of national memory aspect to it. So... So I'm walking down the canal, in this case, to Washington's Crossing, and I meet this hilarious guy. He was walking up the canal, and he's on his phone, and he said, oh, whoa, whoa, wait, I got to go. And he puts his phone out. I said, are you that guy who's walking in New York? <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, I am. He said, do you mind if I walk with you? I said, no, of course not. So we walk a ways, and he had grown up right at where Washington, right near where Washington's Crossing of the Delaware happened. So every year they would do these reenactments. And so he, what was so hilarious about it was he became this channeler of like the real experience. And he was, you know, we all know the painting that was came out in like the 1870s or something like that of, you know, Washington and 25 other people in a rowboat, um, which is not accurate, by the way. Um, but so Travis... Um, People don't realize, Travis said, how dicey the whole thing was, how it could have all gone up in smoke, possibly snuffing the American cause, how tenuous Washington's hold over was over his own troops. I mean, these guys were standing in the bitter cold and saying, dang, this guy's going to make us cross this river on Christmas, my enlistment's up, like I can literally go home in like less than a week. I get myself out of this bad situation and back of my family, and now I'm standing here, and I'm freezing, and I'm waiting for three hours as everyone else crosses, and I'm wondering, what is it all for? <laughs> and this, again, was like verbatim, and I was like, Travis, who sent you here for this? You know, And that is such an accurate, I think, capturing of what those guys were thinking, like, what are we doing here? So um, I, I wanted to go... I'm going to go backwards. No, go backwards, Debbie. Oh. We're going forward. I know we are. So let's see if we can't get backwards. Um, sorry. That, by the way, is the boats that he really crossed in. And that's it, crossing. And this is you. Yeah. Yeah. That was crossing right where Washington. See, I'm not standing up. I don't have a flag. I don't have a sword. <laughs> Um, and and I did think it was interesting the pictures of the boats. Yeah, those those are Durham boats, and that there was that kind of boat that Washington actually crossed in very large. Those they used to bring everything down the Delaware coal, and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Those were the workhorses of the Delaware River and the canal later. So there was something funny in some of the pictures you took, and, and oh, yeah. some of the people you met. And I don't know why. I, there we go. So this this so. When I set out, one of the things I put a lot of thought into was kind of the concept that when a dragon, sorry, dragon, when a knight goes out on a, a long trip, you know, with his armor and his horse and the whole thing, he's going to encounter a dragon. And so in my case, 
I, the thing I was going to encounter was the Jersey Turnpike. And um, I, you know, I'm a, I was a walker, and the antithesis to the walker was the 12-lane Jersey Turnpike where everybody drives and forgets everything the minute they pass it. And so I said, okay, how am I going to encounter the Jersey Turnpike? So I put all this thought into I found the town of Cranberry, exit 8A off the Jersey Turnpike, that's this perfectly preserved 19th century town. And it has this little lake right there. And this funny guy, oh, so I reached out to this, this historical society and I said, I want to meet with some of you guys this morning. I'm there and talk about the history of Cranberry. And so we met. And then while I'm there, I'm, I'm telling them, I said, oh, I have this perfect plan. When I leave here, I'm going to walk up the Cranberry Brook and then I'm going to go between the warehouses, the Amazon warehouse, the Wayfair warehouse, all the, all the warehouses there. And then I'm going to go underneath the Jersey Turnpike. And this woman, who was well in her 80s, um, that guy's mom said, no, you're not. That's not going to work. You can't do that. It's all bog and bayou and, and wet, and you're not going to be able to do it. But Tim, my son, can get you, he'll, he has a plan, or I can get him to make you a plan. So Tim shows up dressed up in that crazy outfit, because it was like picture day at school. He was an elementary school teacher. And um, I then, he said, I'll give you my kayak and you'll paddle all the way up and have to go over all these things. And then you'll go through the Jersey Turnpike underneath and then it'll be 12 lanes of traffic. And I said, great, Tim, what am I going to do with your kayak? He said, don't worry, just leave it there, which I did. He came back and got it later. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to jump ahead to yeah. uh, where you're, I believe, oh, well, uh, where did we go, Debbie? There, to where, I think this is the Hudson, right? You're no, this is the, the Arthur Kill that separates Perth Amboy from Staten Island. And, and to get across that, you... You know what's really amazing? So I, that was another belonging moment where I am show up in Perth Amboy, and I'm asking these people that live near the water, I said, do you have any idea how I can get across the water? Do you have like a kayak you might lend me or something? And one guy says, um, I don't have a kayak, but I know the combination for the Raritan Yacht Club <laughs> to, to, get, to get out onto the to pier. And I said, you do? And he said, yeah. And I said, thanks, that'll do it. So he gave me the combination. I go out onto the pier and there's some guys out there talking. And I said, I'm on this walk and I need to get across to the Staten Island, which was, you know, 500 yards across there. And they said, oh, I know just the guy. So they call this guy, Stu Conway, who I saw last Friday, amazingly. I've I made friends with like 30 people on one month's walk. And um, this guy um, comes the next morning and he takes me across. And I first said to him, Stu, all you got to do is take me across. It'll be like Omaha Beach, like a landing. I'll just jump out of the boat. You'll just get me near. And he's like, no, Neil, I'm not doing that. But when I said, Stu, where'd you come in from for this? He said, I had to drive about an hour and a half. I was like, you drove an hour and a half to take me across? And he said, yeah, what else was I going to do? You know? um, <laughs> So, so you have a, a chapter called Rapture on the Bayon Bridge. And tell us about this picture and your experience. Yeah, so, you know, this was an amazing moment. I um, I'd stayed the night in Staten Island in the way, you know, top end of the island. And then I was going to go across the Bayon Bridge so that I could go up to Jersey City. And that's the way I was going to go into the city because that's the way that all the travelers did in the old days. You know, if you know that area, the meadowlands and all that is just swamp. There's no way you could get through there in those days. So this is the way they would go. And so I'm walking up the bridge, but I was kind of thinking about stuff. I had my head down. And then when I just took, moved my head up, I saw that view of Manhattan. And I was like quite literally blown away. And I, I had a rapture. <laughs> um, and people who know Bayonne laugh when I say rapture on the Bayonne Bridge. Um, um, so I read, there's a big thing my wrote. My delight sprang in part from the satisfaction of nearing the end of a long pilgrimage. It may have been tinged even by some fleck of regret that it was nearly over. I had seen for the first time laid out against the morning sky an outline of the place I'd been walking toward for 25 days, a skyline altered utterly by human hands with sheets of glass jutting to impossible heights, from a sliver of metamorphic schist tucked between two rivers. 
This weird rapture, though, went beyond mere gratification. I had seen this skyline before. A thousand times over the years, I had caught sight of it from all directions as a cab driver and a common traveler. But on this morning, the sight of it physically astonished and stunned me. The days and all those steps had pried open a part of the human spirit that magnifies the potency of otherwise simple things and grants the commonplace a touch of the divine. So, so I included this because you talk about playing chess in Washington Square and that you actually beat this guy. We're not so sure, but we, we, it's we don't have time to talk. It's part of the book, but I really did win. So, so we're at the end, and uh, you plan to meet your friend Mark. So this, this uh, longtime friend of mine, Martin Indyk, who was the ambassador under Bill Clinton to Israel and was a long time, and you'll see him quoted all the time now with all the stuff going on. Martin and I had gone through the exact same cancer journey, like it was precisely parallel to one another, including we both had relapses at the same time. So Martin said, when you get to Manhattan, I will lead you to the end of your trip. So we met at the Atlas statue at Rockefeller Center, and he walked me forward. And you can So he was on his way. He said, I'm going to take you to a place that was of great significance to him, um, which was the um, Bethesda Fountain, if any of you know Central Park, where you walk the plaza, you go through the arcade. By the way, I think Central Park is like, you know, one of the most sacred places in America. And this arcade... Olmsted and Vox design, the whole thing is gorgeous. All these people were out. We thought COVID was over. It wasn't. Um, everybody was celebrating. And so he, um, he got me to the fountain, which is just there. Um, throughout his ordeals, and still now as a treated one, Martin would come often to stand at that magnificent pool and bow his head to the angel of the waters. He came on the worst of days. By the way, the angel of the waters is a statue that's at the Bethesda Fountain, which is in honor of the bringing of water to the island of Manhattan, which, as a water person, I think is such a beautiful thing. Um, he came on the worst of days when he feared he might not make it, and on a spring day like this, when new life burst out all around us. As we stood there, Martin repeated the prayer he recites every time he visits, a common prayer from the Talmud called the Shananahu. Somebody else here is going to be able to say it better than me. He said it first in Hebrew and then in his preferred version in English. Thank you, God, for giving me life, for sustaining me, and for making it possible that I might arrive at this time. And... <laughs> that you know there's I mean that to me is sort of the the, po the prayer of all prayers thank you for giving me life for sustaining me and for making it possible that I might arrive at this time can I get you to read the, this last quote and then we'll end okay by the way whenever I read that it is you know thank you for letting me arrive at this time um I think you can say that multiple times a day. Friends asked what I had learned. This is the post-amble when I had gotten back home. Friends asked what I had learned, and I tried to explain. If you go out to your front door with an eye for all that baffles, amazes, enchants, and keep at it day after day, giving into the landscape and letting the rhythm of your steps guide you, it's astonishing what can ensue. Within days, you understand why the holy books have whole sections built around the stories, the one-off encounters of men and women out walking. Very particular things, a sermon by a man out getting his trash can, the hand-forged hinges on an old barn, how the maples flower, then leaf, acquire very particular meanings. They tell stories that weave together into a riddle, that is long and flowing and difficult to explain, should you feel the compulsion to explain. You bring meaning with you when you go out looking for meaning, and the more of it you bring, 
the more you get in return. Thank you very much, Neil. No, thank you. Thank you. 